is more necessarily better? When do we have enough? And what happens when everything we've ever wanted and we have it isn't enough? These are the kinds of questions that are being raised by today's lessons. Now, admittedly, Ecclesiastes is nobody's favorite book from the Old Testament or even from the Bible as a whole. But it's not all as dour as it may sound in today's pericope, that passage that was read, but it is true that the author keeps coming up with the phrase, all is vanity, vanity. And you begin to wonder, is there any meaning to life at all? But he concludes the book, I'm happy to say, we don't get it in today's lesson, but he concludes it by saying, yes, one needs to live more fully in the moment, in the present, and take one's gratification where you can get it in the here and now. It's a perfect tie-in with the parable that Jesus tells about the rich fool who keeps building bigger and bigger barns to store all of his stuff so he can enjoy it later on, except that for him there is no later on. He dies before he has a chance to uh, uh, do anything with it. And that is even reflected in today's psalm. So we need to ask the question, what do these lessons suggest for us and our own life? Well, I have to admit, I had an early lesson in some of this within my own family from my father, although it was a negative lesson at the time. My father was a wonderful person in many ways. He was a hard worker. He was really dedicated to his job and to causes which he espoused. But he was also a type one personality. And so as I was growing up as a child, my recollection of my father was that he would arrive home late from work, gulp down some supper, sit in his favorite chair with the newspaper, and within minutes he was asleep because he was exhausted. And then my mother would wake him up at 10 o'clock so he'd go upstairs and go to bed. So as a child, I often felt cheated that I wasn't able to really enjoy the father I had known as a very small child who spent time with me. And I was resentful of that. And I think he felt badly too. Fortunately for him, in some senses, he had a heart attack at age 48, and that changed his life. He survived the heart attack, fortunately. He uh, made changes in his life, and he began to live more fully in the present moment with the family. He changed jobs so that he was no longer demanded in the kind of degree he had been demanded in the previous job, and he was a lot happier, and we were a lot happier. But then he went on to teach me a lesson also that relates to today's lessons. I mean, inadvertently, he had no intention of teaching me this. But my father and my mother had grand plans. They had deferred a lot until retirement. They were married in 1929, so they never kind of got over the sense that the wolf was on the other side of the door, even long after the wolf had disappeared uh, to somebody else's door. And so they were lived frugally, and they saved, and they had all these marvelous plans, and they bought a camper, and when my father retired at age 65, they were going to spend two years traveling around the country deciding where they wanted to settle down. But two months after my father retired, he died of a heart attack. So none of those plans came to fruition. I was in my early 30s at the time, and it made a profound impression on me. I then understood what Ecclesiastes and today's gospel were trying to say. It's important to find your satisfaction, your gratification in the present moment to the degree that you can, and it's not necessarily helpful to keep deferring satisfaction and gratification, especially in the things that really matter. But there was someone else who taught me even more about these lessons later on in life. Some of you know that at one point in my career, I was for 11 years the rector of St. Paul's Church in Natick, Massachusetts. Well, Natick, Massachusetts is also the home of Temple Israel of Natick, which is the synagogue in which Harold Kushner 
ministered for many, many years, including the 11 years that I was a priest in the parish. Temple Israel and St. Paul's had a very close relationship. We cooperated in a number of community services, but we also had living room dialogues between Episcopalians and Jews. And I think most inventively, perhaps this is an idea for the cathedral or other, other congregations. I don't know anybody who does this in the Diocese of Maryland. All of the nursery care, child care persons in our nursery on Christmas and Easter were members of the Jewish community. And on the Jewish High Holy Days, all of the nursery care, child care people at the synagogue were Episcopalians. It was a wonderful way to kind of share with one another in a very homey kind of way. In any event, I got to know Harold and Suzette Kushner, and I knew them at the time that their son Aaron died very tragically of a disease that he had been diagnosed with when he was two and a half. He died at 13 and a half, just a year after he had been bar mitzvahed. They knew Her that Aaron was going to die. And it was that death and that tragedy that led Harold Kushner to write now his very famous book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. It was on the bestseller list for many years, and it was translated into many languages. I have personally given it to a number of people and suggested it to many more. It's a very good read on the subject of the problem of evil and why it happens to good people. In the aftermath of that, we all expected, and I think members of Temple Israel also expected, that Harold would be swept away by the success of his new career as a, a great writer, but also a person who was in great demand for public speaking. But Harold stayed in Natick. And he was about to come out with another book, and the clergy association asked him if he would address us about the subject of his new book, which came out two months later and was entitled, When Everything You've Ever Wanted Isn't Enough, which I think, frankly, is perhaps his best book. In any event, he told us some things in that gathering that are not in the book, but were very instructive for me. He addressed the fact that after the publication of When Bad Things Happen to Good People, he was inundated with requests from huge synagogues in Los Angeles and New York to come as their rabbi. And he considered these, but he and his wife Suzette decided to stay in Natick. They were in their mid-fifties, and they decided that they would never live long enough to meet and create the relationships that they already had in that community. That community that had been so supportive of him in the death of Aaron, that community in which he had poured out his best years as rabbi, that community in which relationship made all the difference. I'm happy to say, although I have not seen them in years, that Harold and Suzette, now in their 80s, still live in Natick. And as far as I know, they live in the same house that they lived in when I knew them before he became famous. There's a lesson in that example. And as I heard him speak to the clergy association about his decision to stay in Natick, I thought about that for my own life. It's one of the primary reasons why in my retirement I have stayed here in Baltimore. I decided by the time I had finished my 12 years as bishop of the diocese, I would never live long enough to make the kind of relationships that I already had in this place. And that some of my best memories of ministry and some of my most enhanced feelings about people exist here, not somewhere beyond. It's perhaps a lesson for all of us to think about where in your own life might you pour yourself more fully into the present? Do you fa in fact have enough? Is striving after more success or more money or um, doing new things and exciting things, how important is that in comparison to the things that really matter? And where could you capitalize each day on living life to its fullest? The lessons of 
today are not necessarily downers. They are simply reminders that life is unpredictable, that life is more than success or wealth, that life often has to do with the relationships we make and the degree to which we give ourselves to each other. Life has a lot to do with living in community, caring for our neighbors, and yes, letting them care for us. It's a, I've said over the years to many of the priests that I have encountered, and they understand this because any good priest has already come to this conclusion, ministry is always a two-way street. We think we're ministering to other people, but in fact, all the time we're ministering to them, they are also ministering to us. These are the things that last. These are the things that give life meaning. These are the things that make it possible for us to face into the vagaries of life, even into death itself, with confidence, with confidence that we have purpose, that we are loved by God, and we are loved in community. So live fully in the present. Go from this place and live it up, as it were. Not because tomorrow you may die, but because today is your opportunity to maximize the person that Christ has called you to be. Vocation has a lot to do with being happy and living in the moment. Vocation is our calling. Each of us is called by God to live in a certain way and to live in relationship to certain people and to do it to the maximum degree that we are able and to trust the Holy Spirit to give us power to do those things that we cannot do. When we live into our vocation, we are truly happy with a happiness that lasts. Amen.